I never dreamed when I signed on to here how big this problem was going to be. Watch out for snakes. They're grumpy. Don't you fall down. You're going to want to see this. You can see it running out of the surface casing right here. Bubbles right there. Nobody can come out here and say this well's not leaking. I figured we'd find two, three, four, five leakers. And every time I have stuck a bucket in the ground, there's a problem well. The Permian Basin is the world's biggest shale oil production basin, and it's, uh, it's really helped to revolutionize the U.S. oil industry and also the U.S. economy over the last 10 years or so. If the Permian was an OPEC member, it would be as big as Iraq and Kuwait combined. What happens over time is the basin becomes like a layer cake where you have different types of rocks and then in those basins, oil and gas develop. But the Permian has a water problem. For every barrel of oil that is produced in the Permian Basin, you also get about three to five barrels of wastewater. We call it water, but it's, it's pretty toxic stuff. It's as much as five times saltier than the ocean. It contains oil and gas residue, and it contains all other manner of heavy metals and sort of radioactive materials. The vast majority of that water gets re-injected down into the subsurface. And that re-injection changes the pressures and reactivates existing faults. The earthquakes began here, just off of campus. There were a series of mid-magnitude three earthquakes, and they caused quite a bit of alarm. The fact that earthquakes even happen in Texas at all, I grew up in Texas all my life, and this is an unusual concept. Why would you have earthquakes around here? It doesn't make much sense. From 2021 to 2023, you had a couple hundred earthquakes per year. And we started writing stories about how Texas could be on track to eclipse California for the most earthquakes. There is no doubt now that the earthquakes in the Permian Basin are largely driven by oil and gas operations. But most earthquakes out in the Permian Basin are not generated directly from hydrofracking. It's more about the produced water. So both the operator response group and the regulator decided that they had to do something. How about we shift wastewater disposal from deep to shallow? So as you're disposing more in shallow wells, that's starting to build up the pressure in the shallow part of the Earth's crust. And eventually that leads to water leaking and becoming geysers. <laughs> Damn it, I hate when I get wet. I call them zombie wells because they are supposed to be dead. And like zombies, they rise from the grave and they're unkillable because you have to kill the source, which is the produced water. So this is the pipe that's supposed to protect our fresh water from the oil and gas. And I've got oil and gas leaking from below outside of the surface casing. My name is Sarah Stogner, and I'm the lawyer that came out here and started seeing problems with these wells. We are digging up wells because they're leaking this black, stinky stuff, which is crude oil that's supposed to be 2,400 feet below the ground. And because they've been over-injecting water from the new horizontal wells, it's pushing this stuff up and through these old well bores. If the Permian Basin is one like huge giant cake and you've stabbed it enough that it's kind of fragile and then you start taking icing out and that oil comes with water and it's not clean water, it's toxic, it's nasty. Well, you put it into a shallower layer. That shallower layer isn't used to having all of that water in it. And now you've got all these straws that were poked and pressure will find the path of least resistance. And so now what we've got is a disaster of a cake 
that's collapsing over here. It's rising up over here. The icing is leaking between layers. It's coming up at surface. That's what's happening. I think I didn't realize how bad the situation was, and Chevron already did, and the Railroad Commission already did. Do they recognize that there's a problem? Yes. Are they still trying to get rid of any responsibility? Yes. The first thing you need to know about the Railroad Commission of Texas is that it's nothing to do with trains. It's the oil and gas regulator in Texas. Over the years, there have been plenty of other reporting over these toxic geysers erupting seemingly randomly around the oil fields. We really wanted to kind of get to the bottom of this to say, what is the relationship between the regulator and the industry? And what did they know? When did they know it? So we submitted a bunch of freedom of information requests. We received back a huge volume of information. The more we studied it, the more we started to build up a timeline of what went on and the methods they used to balance the problem of earthquakes versus the problem of water disposal. The Railroad Commission in mid-2023 agreed to consider easing restrictions around shallow disposal. So here we have a document from October 2023, which, uh, which states quite clearly that shallow disposal has some serious problems. They actually state that they are seeing leaks as a result of shallow water disposals. Hey, breakouts reported by field operations could be linked to shallow disposal. This is a presentation from the Railroad Commission to the Texas Pipeline Association. This is not a presentation to the public, but again, it shows that the Railroad Commission was fully aware of some of the hazards that were coming from increased reservoir pressure. Indeed, I have a slide here titled Hazards from Increased Reservoir Pressure. It includes drilling hazards, well damage, tubular corrosion, harm to legacy production, confinement failure, surface flows, and harm to underground sources of drinking water which raises a lot of questions. Why proceed when you know that there are clear and present dangers? If we want to continue to produce oil and gas in Texas, in the United States, we have to find a solution to the water problem. What began a couple years ago was an effort to start to look at other ways to reuse this water. The treated water, it's clear. You don't see any particulate in it. Um, this is essentially distilled quality water. We look at this desalinated produced water as another way to supplement that fresh water and provide another source. That fresh water can then be used for other industrial applications like cooling towers, things like building and construction materials for agriculture. There's a lot of optimism for what can happen. What you're really hoping is that you can maybe claw out about half of the produced water that is coming out of these wells right now. That would give a lot of breathing room to the oil and gas industry. We're now at the point where we wonder how fast this can sort of be made economical for the oil companies to clean it in scale. How fast can they get the technology working properly where it's reliable? Um, and so that, that's, that's a big if. 2018, 2019, we were talking about eight to 10 million barrels of water a day. Two years ago, we were talking about 18 million barrels, and now we're talking about 25 to 30 million barrels. And these horizontal wells, the older they get, the more water they produce to oil. The problem is not getting better, it's only gonna get worse. People just think of West Texas as a barren wasteland, and that's, that's not what it is. Oh, we got some wildlife, there's deer run through here, 
there's bobcats, and uh, this should be a huge concern for the Railroad Commission, but it's not in their backyard.